Hello. One of the common questions I get is how we transform the knowledge about the types of hypoxia into um, applying it to the CTG interpretation. So we came along with a framework that you can easily use anytime you need to make decisions and we are using CTG to inform you on that decision. So let me share with you a couple of slides. I hope this will be useful and it's something that you can easily start using by tomorrow. So we are gonna call this next 10 or 15 minutes a framework for CTG interpretation, which is called CTG in three easy steps. Of course, every time we are looking at CTG, we are aiming to reduce hypoxic stress, injury, and or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and at the same time, avoiding unnecessary intervention in labor. So, physiological CTG in three easy steps. Which ones are these steps? Step one is always to ask in the beginning, is the baby fit for labor? What we are aiming is to exclude antenatal injuries and especially chronic hypoxia. Then once you are in labor, we will need to know if the baby is subject to hypoxic stress, which most babies will be and will go through labor with no problems, but you want to know the phases of physiological response to stress and especially when there are any signs of decompensation. And a step three that you could call it an umbrella or an helicopter view, it's always to take in account the overall picture because decisions in labor cannot only be based on the CTG. So let's start with step one. Is the baby fit for labor? So this is something that you need to address in the beginning. In the way we work with shift works and coming across um, women in labor that are already mid um, journey or if they come already at late stages of labor, it's always important to consider the beginning. So at the beginning, you look at baseline, viability, the presence of accelerations, and you want to exclude shallow or late decelerations. But if I want to make this very simple and into what are from that what is really important is that you confirm that you have a stable baseline with a fetal heart rate that is appropriate for gestation and normal viability and cycle. Let me give you some examples where this didn't happen. So when we look, many, many people ask me, what do you mean by um, baseline that is appropriate for gestation? Normal baseline in most guidelines is between 110 and 160, but this is for the population of babies at term, between 37 and 42 weeks. And what we know from fetal physiology is that babies at preterm or early term, they tend to have a baseline that tends to be on the higher side of normal, but for babies that are late term or post term, they should be on the low side of normal. As a rule of thumb, you know, over 40 weeks, you expect the baby to be less than 150 beats per minute in terms of the fetal heart baseline. Let's give you some examples. This is a baby that is 40 weeks gestation and um, the woman attended with reduced fetal mood. As you can imagine, Many babies that are subjected to chronic hypoxia that came to the point of decompensation, they will present with reduced fetal movements. Reduced fetal movements is a very, very common um, presentation and only a few percentage of those will be chronic hypoxia. But it's very important that we know how to recognize those on the CTG. The baseline is here 150. 150 is not what you would expect for a 40 week on top of that, you have reduced viability and these shallow decelerations. This is a very typical case of chronic hypoxia. This baby was delivered without uh, further stress, so pre-labor and still uh, sustained hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. 
What about this one? This woman was a multip, 39 weeks gestation, presented also in early labor with reduced fetal movements. So what you see here is a baseline of 160. Overall, this variable is reduced. There's no accelerations and there's no decelerations. So some people will say, how do you know this baby's not sleeping? Do you know the baby's not sleeping? You know and I know. And we know because neonates in quiet sleep, so in deep sleep, they have few movements. So usually they don't have motor activity, they don't have accelerations. But overall, the heart rate is decreases. So it's never a baby that is tachycardic. The variability is reduced in deep sleep, and that's physiological and is normal, but not at a higher baseline. So you don't sleep tachycardic, the same happens with the fetus. So reduced variability at a higher baseline is always a sign of concern and attention. So this baby was delivered by cesarean section uh, in no active labor and still sustained a global brain injury and unfortunately a neonatal death. So there's no point that if you know that this baby is not sleeping, there's no point in trying to wake the baby up. There's no point in giving food or ice cubes or um, you know, selling for a walk or repeating the CTG in half an hour in the expectation that it would improve. Once you make the diagnosis of chronic hypoxia, the correct rule of action is to expedite delivery unless you are the delivery is imminent. So once you are certain that you have excluded the babies that are not fit for the journey of labor, then during labor, anytime we address a CTG, there's three questions in this framework that we encourage you to ask. Question number one, is the baby subject to hypoxic stress? Well, many babies will be subject to hypoxic stress because that's part of normal labor and that will come as the form of decelerations. And is the baby using additional compensation mechanisms for it? That's when uh, the baby has increased the baseline in response to the decelerations. We call it a cat column insert. And again, this is a compensation mechanism. And very importantly, you'll be looking at signs of decompensation. And we'll look, we'll look at that shortly. But for all of you that have been looking at types of hypoxia and physiological CDG interpretation, you know which they are. Less time at the baseline or abnormal viability, either increased or reduced. Let's go through some examples. Um, this, is, this slide was to remember you the types of hypoxia. So this is where we are now. So most babies will sustain some degree of hypoxic stress that for most of them, this causes no harm, is normal. We have seen how to exclude chronic hypoxia in the beginning of the trace. And gradually evolving hypoxia, the stress that evolves during the hours of labor, subacute, the more intense stress that usually you see over the developing of minutes and the acute one, Sudden, uh, sudden cut in oxygen delivery, typical of acute uh, hypoxic episodes. So let's go then, we were looking at three stages, three questions when you are in labor to ask if the baby is subjected to hypoxic stress, D cells. Let's look at them. So if you ask now, is this baby subjected to some form of hypoxic stress? You need to say yes. Yes, it is. You see D cells. Now, most importantly, you want to know, is the baby compensating or decompensating? So we have been unfortunately um, trained to look and to you know, pay a lot of attention on the D cells. What I su suggest to you is that you forget the D-cells, delete them, and look in between the D-cells. And believe it or not, this is the same trace. And in between the D-cells, you can see that the baseline is stable, that the baby is spending more time 
in between the cells then decelerating and that the viability in between is normal. So to answer your second question, is the baby using now, is there been a cat column in search? Well, this baseline is about 140 here. To answer that, you will need to go to the beginning of the CTG and see what was the initial baseline. If this baseline was the, in the beginning 140, you'll say, well, no, this baby is completely chilled out, has not even yet released a drop of cut colonies. If the baby in the beginning was 110 or 120, you would say, yes, the hypoxic stress is enough to trigger a cat colony response. And so in that case, what you need to do is, especially if you are in the early phases of labor, and especially if the woman is under oxytocin acceleration, you should reduce that. So important message is that in the presence of a stable baseline and normal variability, when more time is spent at the baseline than decelerating, the risk of acidosis is extremely low and you should continue your routine care. So what are then the signs of decompensation? And you see here, reduce or increase variability or less time at the baseline. Let me give you some examples. If you come across a CTG like this, then if you ask the question, is the baby subjected to hypoxic stress? Well, yes, it is. There's plenty of D-cells. Now, if you do the same exercise, delete the decelerations and see what is left in between the D-cells, you see that despite a pretty stable baseline, if you want to call it baseline, um, you have very little time. And if you look the overall, lots of periods of increased variability that we call this zigzag pattern. This is what we call a subacute hypoxia, but more importantly, what I want to raise your attention is signs of decompensation. So less time at the baseline than decelerating, we call it subacute hypoxia. Quite usually associated with episodes of increased variability, saltatory or zigzag pattern, which is this that you see here. And if you look at other signs of decompensation will be a decreased variability at a higher baseline or unstable baseline as you see here. So, which one is then step three? Step three is an important step. Um, and when we, we use this thread, these three steps, continuously over every time you assess the CTG is not to forget the overall picture. And this is about, you know, progress in labor, other risk factors like meconium, epidural, and also to understand that encephalopathy can be caused by other causes rather than hypoxia. So there are other mechanisms of encephalopathy that can cause fetal compromise and neonatal um, poor outcome that are not directly related to hypoxia, especially the infection inflammation pathway. And I'm sure there will be other videos to look into that. Um, things like hyponatremia and hypohypoglycemia and the effects of medications or even epidural if it causes maternal hypertension. Just to summarize, step one, answer the question, is the baby fit for labor? And that you usually look at the beginning. So with your aim is mostly to exclude chronic hypoxia, although you can also see other um, uh, forms of antenatal, antenatal injury on the CTG, like anemia, or for instance, um, brain injury. So, but chronic hypoxia presents with a high baseline, reduced variability and shallow cells, and I'm sure that all of you can now recognize this. If that's the case, we say this baby is not fit for labor, the safer route of action will be to deliver by cesarean section. If the baby starts well, we know what are the normal mechanisms to compensate for hypoxic stress and most babies will go through labor without any problem and will be delivered before the decompensation phase 
but we are there to watch them and to make sure that these cells, we know that that's normal in labor. We look for any signs of uh, compensation mechanism being activated, like the cat column in search, where there's an increase in fetal baseline heart rate following the D cells. In that case, your call of action should be to decrease the stress, reduce the symptom, and very importantly, to always be aware of signs of decompensation, which will be less time at the baseline or changes in the viability, either increased or reduced. And Anytime you look at the CTG, don't lose the overall picture, call it the helicopter view or the, an umbrella to wrap all your um, decision making and understanding. Exclude other causes of hypoxic, uh, non-hypoxic causes of fetal compromise. Take in account which stage of labor you are and how is the progress of labor. And of course, women's choice and human factors. I hope you enjoyed this small uh, video. Um, for more information, please look at the website and you can download the guidelines and have some um, toolkits and uh, uh, the table with the uh, types of hypoxia um, free from the website. Thank you.